Um, well, first of all, thank you for that detail, which will be immediately incorporated. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I very much meant to bring out um, the politics of that nostalgia. I think it's, it's all about um, a very concerted and deliberate attempt to make certain kinds of history illegible. Uh, that's what I was trying to get at with um, sort of counterposing uh, my reading of that that uh, that narrative of the Lost Archive with, with Trio's the way the Trio formulates right. uh, perceptions of the Haitian Revolution that they're always unthinkable. I, I think that could be made unthinkable, and that, that the nostalgia is a powerful tool for um, for doing that. And also, um, just to get back to Chris's um, point, uh, which I think relates about how certain material takes hold of us. I mean, I, part of the reason I I can't let go of that um, that bizarre uh, Casada worm stuff is because. <laughs> Uh, you know, I often find, I, you know, when I, the first time I read it, I found myself uh, almost unconsciously, you know, wishing that this archive existed, right, as a, as a histor you know, someone who works on the history of science. I just, I was immediately struck by what a compromised position that would be, uh, and, and, and therefore how effective the nostalgia was, uh, even within our own sort of uh, epistemology. Whenever I hear the word Atlantic history, automatically another great historical tradition jumps into my mind, and that's the history of the Mediterranean, and that's the classic work by Braudel. All I'm hearing here is conjuncture, with a few events stuck in there. I'm asking you, do you believe that there can be a long durée narrative of Atlantic history? If there isn't, why do you call it Atlantic history? <laughs> I'll say no. Uh, I don't find the long durée interesting. I don't think writing the geological history of the uh, of the sea and the oceans. I don't know. Leave that to geologists. Uh, yes. Let me interject something here. Yeah. I mean, Rodell's long durée is geological and geographic, but it's not only. It's you not only read that, that very carefully. That first very long part of those very long two volumes. There's lots of people. Right. There's lots of motion, there's lots of animals, there's all sorts of things in there. That's so it's, it's, like, it's, never, it's never a history without the people. Right. And I think that that's something we often kind of forget about Cordell, that you know, always say, oh, well, along the way, we can't write that because you know, we're interested in people and there are no people in it. But that's not true. There are people in it from the very beginning. And it's not that you just get mountain passes and, you know, uh, bays and that you have people who are actually being shaped by those, but also shaping them. And there's a lot of emotion in that static. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, shared I, customs, shared anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mentioned Bordel yesterday as one of the people, um, you know, that must be behind any attempt to put this together. And I will defer from, I guess, from Chris in being completely invested in the Atlantic paradigm. To me, what is significant about um, the Atlantic paradigm is that I think, and I, we, this is now a, a provocation, I guess, I think it's the only uh, paradigm that allows one to understand properly the triangular trade uh, and its relationship to the formation of the modern world. That's why the whole conscripts business is important, you know, to my mind, in understanding that. So I think the, uh, that, that, that's one component of Atlanticism and Atlantic thought that it encapsulates. Maybe. That's why the Brodel analogy does break down. I don't think that it fits because the Mediterranean is a smaller sea and it's an older, in that sense, it's easier to think of it as a unit of analysis. Oceans are broader and um, there are more spaces involved in that. There are connections and there are commodities as we've been tracing, but sometimes they're transoceanic, sometimes. So that's just my short thought on that. I was just gonna say, um, and this may take us back to the question about narratives. I, I, you've convinced me uh, with what you just said about the, the importance of the Atlantic paradigm. Um, and it, to the extent that we're thinking about Atlantic narratives, narr all narratives have purview of some kind. So when we say Atlantic narrative, we've, we've designated in some way what its purview is. What I think has been really interesting about all these papers is how many times we've ended up beyond the Atlantic, mm -hmm. in the Pacific, um, somewhere else. And I think that could be something that Atlantic studies May or should take with it into the future. This sense that it, of its own its own narrative purview should always be in tension with other narrative purviews that may not even be easily glimpsed from within what one's writing about. I mean, 
on some level, isn't that what empire gives us? I mean, it seems to me that one sort of problem with, and I'm not talking about kind of institutional histories of empire, kind of yeah. Charles McLean Andrews, and I, I guess nobody probably wants to do that anymore. Um, but I would suggest that, you know, the Atlantic paradigm does have some, some boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of self-contained. I mean, the same way that Braudel is. But empires, I think, and the kind of social history of empire uh, allow us to sort of probe out from there, I think, in an effective way. And so I sort of worry sometimes that we, we think about empire as Atlantic historians in a, in a kind of mealy-mouthed way. Hmm. Those sound like fighting words. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think, I, oh, sorry. You, no, you go ahead. Well, I mean, I can actually also um, wonder sometimes when we're, I mean, clearly the conceptual utility of the Atlantic uh, paradigm has been much debated, almost more talked about than it's been utilized, I have to say. <laughs> And my forays into the, into the world, I just want to point out that the Atlantic may be a paradigm, but it's not a method. And it, we really, I think, have to, to be clear that I think there's an implicit method that many of us bring to our work on the Atlantic, especially when we seek connections or circulations. And I think it is a comparative method that comes in disguise which is that our discovery is the comparative one where we presume or we set up the straw man of pre previous writings, previous literatures, previous historiographies as being empire bound, region bound, or nation bound. And our great discovery is, oh, nations are not nearly as important, these empires are not so hermetically sealed, and, and, and then what? And I suppose that I'm, I, I would like to just make a point that at least in terms of the paradigm, I would like to see the future push beyond the observation of connections. I would like to know more about how prevalent the connections were. In fact, I believe that maybe it was you, William, who pointed out that, and, and it's very easy to do this, but the, the statement that, you know, that the kinds of um, long, you know, multiple region genealogies of the, these figures in the early modern world in the Atlantic, you know, that they've come from so many places and they've read from so many places, and, 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 and your, your comment was, and that was so common. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that it was still that common. Mm -hmm. In other words, I believe it was, it, it was important and significant yeah. and formed a very crucial crust, especially among literate, uh, um, among literate um, uh, and the, the literate and the powerful, of the early modern world, but I, I, I still am not comfortable with the notion that the circulation and the, uh, the detachment and these ruptures from region were the, um, were the sine qua non of, of, of living in the early modern Americas or in the early modern, in early modern Europe. And that's, the, it's just, maybe that's the challenge or the fighting more. Yeah, I want to say two things. Yeah. <laughs> One, um, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I agree, sure. It's not, you know, most people are not you know, dashing between uh, continents and, and empires, uh, clearly. Uh, it's a relatively uh, small number of people, in fact, who, who have such unusual trajectories as the one individual that I, I was focusing on. But I think something like if, if the Atlantic Enlightenment, for instance, is going to be a useful category, it it's refers to a relatively small number of individuals. It may, doesn't necessarily make it any less important, but I think it's true that there was a, a relatively limited number of people who were involved in that as a specific type. That doesn't mean there aren't other intellectuals who aren't doing intellectual activity, but they aren't necessarily to be categorized as a kind of in, being a part of Enlightenment thought. Except that I think that there are lots of people, as in my paper, who are involved in Enlightenment thought who have never read uh, anything that was derived from Europeans, nor were they leaving much farther than the, than the distance between Lurin and, and Lima. And so I think we need to rethink of, uh, uh, at least the Enlightenment and the Atlantic in a very different way that doesn't <coughs> trace ideas as, as if there are objects that travel or as if they, they can be embodied in only people. But this simultaneity that, that, that Sunil talked about needs to be grappled with a, in a far more serious manner. How can it be that an indigenous woman from Lurin is practicing a kind of rights-based uh, language and she doesn't know who, you know, Montesquieu yeah, She's practicing, you know? is, she, is she developing? I think so. That's the, that was the point of my yeah. paper. I think that she's as much, I think she's as much a practitioner. I think she's as much a practitioner. And the, and the traces are in the archives, the traces she, are in what? I mean, what is, the, what is the effect of her development, I guess, the larger effect? I, I guess I'm a little perplexed. I mean, my, my, my argument is that the larger effect is to open a space within uh, legal discourse in various places in which women begin to articulate 
uh, rights as, a, as, as the basis of, of their kind of identity, which is enlightenment if, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. So I do think that one of the things that we've done is followed European historians, you know, wonderfully though it is, I imagine this mother load of information about everyday engagements and practices of these, these kind of practices that we're all tracing to be among peasants and everybody was going to be doing them. And in fact, we're, you know, we, we, we can't, we have to look at the state of historiography or literature as it stands in very places. I guess that's what I was saying before, that we can't presume that because it's exhausted this kind of, you know, English to American, you know, exchange that that's not good anymore, yeah. right? Comparison's still good, right? Communication is good, but the circulation isn't the only, the only um, m metaphor for what we're looking for. And can I just